So yeah, I'm Lillian Otler. I um, work with the Equitable Food Initiative. I've been there with them for about close to six years now. It's a relatively young program, so I've been um, part of the team for um, since early on. Yeah. Hi, and I'm Natalie, <laughs> and I work with Fair Trade USA. It's a fair trade um, organization. I've been with the organization over five years now. I was also an intern and a consultant. <laughs> and right now I'm the head of our produce and floral department. Excited to be here with you guys. And we, uh, we were talking about how we wanted to share <laughs> that we had never met, but we've been talking and we worked together on trying to present a unified voice for this presentation. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Um, communicate more about the movement and the issues that exist and some solutions and different approaches mm -hmm. that our programs have. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a great opportunity for us to meet working in their programs. Exactly. Good milestone here as well. Yeah. Um, and and we we thought that we, you know, would try to um, focus in our in our talk a bit on Sort of how you all and the rest of us as consumers might perceive some of these programs and so we thought we'd just start off by asking you um what you're having for lunch today and <laughs> how what criteria you use how did you decide what to procure for your lunch what were you thinking about when you got your lunch i don't know if anybody wants to share it's not it's not the point is not to call out or shame anybody just like what do you think about when you when you decide what to buy for lunch anyone want to share that yeah so um a salad and coffee that uh such vegetables and a quesadilla with tortillas and cheese, and most of the ingredients. I live in Castro Valley, so I don't have quite the assortment of options that you have in Berkeley, but I um, got some at Trader Joe's and some at Safeway, and I looked at some of it's organic, some of it's not, and but I looked more at the quality, the price, and the convenience. Mm -hmm. So, like, I get the lettuce that's already washed for the night. Just have to put it out. So convenience is big for me, but then also I won't get lettuce and them all brown and stuff. So the quality and then of course price. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Probably typical of a lot of consumers. Yeah. Anyone else want to share what you think about when you go to the go to the go buy your food? So I've had the unfortunate um, programming of being really exposed to a lot of the issues within the <laughs> consumer and food supply chain. So it's hard for me to not think about those issues uh, as a consumer. Yeah. Um, and I'm really well trained in sustainable food guidelines and where your food comes from. And that's where a lot of my work has been in the past. And so for me, a lot of mine are value-based decisions in terms of where the food's actually coming from and who's growing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the really privileged place to actually use my dollar as a voting mechanism to support these changes in the food system as opposed to a lot of the populations that we work with which are more lower income but often don't have the capacity to pay a little bit more money for that so mm -hmm. currently i'm tackling food waste um, i bought organic lettuce from the bargain bin section mm -hmm. at berkeley bowl it was mm -hmm. about to go bad so i Got it for really cheap, actually. Um, and the egg that I have in here is from a farmer friend of mine. Um, and then I have some avocado from a California avocado ranch, and then olive oil from a friend of mine who grows olives. So right I'm really right lucky on. to be really yeah. connected, though, to these yeah. networks. I'm very privileged. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to share? <laughs> I can share if it's helpful. Um, so I, um, my lunch today is not the most sustainable. <laughs> As to that, we uh, belong to a CSA, a community support agriculture. So a lot of the produce that we get is from Bull Valley Farm, which is a farm not too far away from here that I am personally familiar with, and I know they have very good labor conditions and use sustainable production techniques and organic and all of that good stuff. 
And then other than that, you know, when I shop, um, I try to buy organic because it's better for the planet and better for workers and better for me and my family. Um, and then if there is any kind of like fair trade product, you know, I will choose those, fair trade coffee or chocolate or bananas if they're available. And um, other than that, I find it very hard to know actually a lot about the food that we get. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't. I don't have a lot of time to be sourcing products from different places. And so, you know, I usually go to Trader Joe's and, you know, just hope for the best. Right? So. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for sharing. Well, and we're going to touch a little bit more on, on that, you know, sort of how confusing it can be for consumers. But we thought we'd start by just kind of an over, with an overview of some of the challenges that exist in the food system. Right. Um, so, as many of us should do, <laughs> you know, quality, price, convenience, I think those are definitely things we all tend to look at, especially now more with um, the nutrition of the food, organic, not. Um, but on, touching on the values piece, you know, there's, there's a lot more going on, as we're learning, um, with our food than just that and quality and price and organic or conventional. There's the whole behind the scenes, right, of the labor and the practices of producing this food and getting it to our stores magically. <laughs> um, and I like, and Lillian was saying that she bucketed some of the issues, and I, I like how she's bucketing them. You know, some of these issues can be seen as you know, labor practice issues, safety issues, environmental impacts. Um, when it comes to the labor practices piece, there's all sorts of issues that exist. And a lot of these issues can also be found in just labor in general across different sectors. Um, but we're focusing more on ag today. <laughs> Hello, welcome. <laughs> and so it all begins with, you know, where do we even get workers from, right? Contracting and recruiting the workers is a risky subject. The ideal situation is always um, to directly employ your, right? That's a direct relationship. Less people in the, the labor chain, the better. But that's not always possible. And especially like here in California, around 80% of production, mm -hmm. I believe, is uh, the employers, uh, workers, sorry, come from farm labor contracts. And it's more and more a customary thing to outsource where your labor is coming from, especially since there's major uh, labor shortages happening for farms out there. So how can we get workers wherever, however, we just need them because the fruit is rotting on the vine. So recruitment of workers is a very important piece, and there's a lot of issues in the recruitment of workers. If they're recruited locally, you know, there's lots of issues there, but also internationally. There are labor laws in the United States that don't necessarily apply when you come to recruiting. Mm -hmm outside of the United States. It's kind of a no man's land when it comes to our laws flying out there. And many times, you know, in the recruitment line, there's just no visibility into what's happening at that country, that home country. So it's a big issue. And again, the more people in that labor chain, the more problematic, where folks can be charged recruitment fees, there can be abused, even, you know, forced labor, or being held hostage, a lot of things really bad, different levels. So where do you get your workers from? First place, well, love <laughs> Um, Bringing over workers or just having workers on your farm, housing them, that's a major issue as well. First, where do you house them? If you're bringing a worker, it's your responsibility to house them somewhere. If a worker hasn't been recruited, but they're following the crop, let's say, from California up to Washington, well, they, I've heard many workers say, I have to leave this season early because I have to get to the next location to get housing before everybody else arrives. So losing out a little bit of money to get a house on the next farm that they're gonna, or area where they're gonna be harvesting, from grapes to blueberries, let's say. Housing itself, when it's available, very undignified. You have many, many people in small little trailers, for example, being charged exorbitant, exorbitant rates on a weekly basis, um, unsafe, unhealthy conditions. And, you know, at times as well, when it's provided by farms, it can also be unsafe. Too many people, too small areas, not okay. <laughs> uh, 
um, working conditions in general, right? You've got workers out there working overtime um, without breaks, without time mm. for meal breaks as well. There are there's a lot of heat right out there in the field, so not stopping for well, for those uh, shade breaks as well or having cold enough water. There's a lot of laws here domestically, as we know. There's also a lot of um, exemptions for a lot of ag workers and um, lack of enforcement of these laws as well. So while in the United States, at least, there are better laws, there's still a lot of issues happening with different working conditions. So just you know, on the farm practices, also uh, health and safety pieces, people, um, workers having to use different tools that might be, you know, unsafe, scissors that are not working well, ladders that are all rickety, and not having the right protective equipment as well. Or when it comes to agriculture, um, agrochemicals, if agrochemicals are used, too harsh of agrochemicals are used, no um, personal protective equipment is used, or the wrong protective equipment may be used, um, or not exchanged in, in the right time frames, right? So essentially in every area of, uh, of labor, in all the areas the practices for, for farm workers, there are lots of risks, and there's things happening domestically and internationally. Of course, where there's less laws, less enforcement, more things happen, but even here in our backyards, issues are happening. And a lot of times, there's a lack of ways to be able to communicate these issues, and there's fears, lots of fear of intimidation and fear, discrimination, all of that involved. Want to add to just maybe one yeah, big please. one I would add that um, is sexual harassment. Oh, yeah. You know, um, it's known that there's very, very large incidents of sexual harassment and violence in, in agriculture. So, I think both of our programs focus on that. Um, so, yeah, and so. So there's all of the um, labor practices that are challenges within the industry um, that, that Natalie mentioned. And then um, just one piece that we thought we would touch on, um, since because of your interest in, in food and food access and nutrition is just something that I'm not an expert on at all. You probably know more about this, but there is there have been a lot of studies showing that, that farm workers um, have particularly poor um, access to healthy food um, and um, just you know if food insecurity is is defined as a you know not inconsistent access to food to support a healthy active life um, farm workers uh, I see some of the statistics I saw I see these aren't may not be the most recent but that in the um, U.S. population in general, about 14% of the population is food insecure. Among Latinos, about 22% nationally. Latinos in California, about 40%, and farm workers much higher than that. Um, because of poverty, because of high housing costs, because a lot of the farm worker housing doesn't actually have kitchens in it, um, because um, there's a very low use of public benefits among farm workers for all kinds of reasons. People think they're ineligible or they don't understand the application process or they're afraid to apply because of their documentation status or because of seasonal income fluctuations. Um, and then there's also high rates of, of the diet related diseases among farm workers, um, uh, diabetes and hypertension and obesity because of a poor diet. So, um, and yeah, so that's that's a whole area that you all may already have looked into. Um, that's related to to living and working conditions in my farm workers. Right. To add to yeah. that, um, you know, when there is a lot of times there might be some medical care available in surrounding mm -hmm. areas. Sometimes there's not. But a big issue, what we've been hearing also, is the lack of continuing medical service. When you have highly migrant populations um, that might have made a connection with a clinic in Southern California as they move north following the harvest season, you know, 
their files might not be transferred. They might not know how to get in contact with others. There are some organizations working on that, the Migrant Clinicians Network. Um, so there's still, there's still a minority of the groups that know how to access this continuing health. So it's a big So then we come to this other big bucket um, of challenges in the food system, um, which is related to food safety or, you know, sort of these um, contamination, right, the potential for contamination um, of uh, food, especially fresh fresh food, fresh produce. Um, and um, it's been something that the industry has been focusing on for a while now, and there's, a, you know, especially among larger, you know, players in the industry, there's a lot of required um, standards and audits, you know, to related to, to their food safety practices, but obviously it's still not a problem that's been solved. Just recently there was a Right, a big recall of romaine lettuce. And um, so that is something that both retailers and producers are very um, concerned about because the implications of, uh, of, of a food safety crisis are huge, right, in terms of lawsuits and losses and obviously the impact on consumers. Um, and then another uh, uh, bucket is the environmental impact of, um, of agriculture, especially if we're talking about um, industrial agriculture, right, big, big agriculture um, in terms of uh, the uh, pesticide use and um, soil management, water management, uh, Deforestation. Deforestation, right. So, yeah, those are kind of some of the major the major challenges facing, you know, facing all of us, you know, who participate in the food system. That um, some of these programs are trying to address. Some of these programs. Okay, yeah. So the other thing, so what we want is, so there, is, there are a number of uh, labeling programs, uh, verification schemes, um, both visible and less visible out there um, that are trying to address some of those, you know, those challenges that we mentioned. And, but there's a lot of them, and it can probably get confusing for the average consumer. And so we just also wanted to ask you all, are you familiar, which labels are you familiar with? Are you familiar with any of these? What, you know, what are some of the things that you look for um, when you are shopping for food? I've, I mean, I've seen sure these labels you. before, but it's sometimes hard to know, like, what is behind the label in terms of, like, you know, a lot of them say fair trade, but that might be a different definition for each label. Mm -hmm. um, and I sometimes I'm not even sure what it means. <laughs> like, there's, like, multiple labels. I'm like, wow, like, I don't know if you're just, like, as a the producer putting these on to make a consumer who likes to look at labels take it, whereas mm -hmm. there's maybe not the most rigor behind the label. Like third mm -hmm. ones I know like USDA organic, um there's like label color schemes that matter and sometimes there's like foods that are called organic that might not be based on the USDA certification, mm -hmm. which it can be a little confusing I think for consumers. Mm -hmm. So it's so not always easy to know what the label yeah. it means, what's behind it. Very familiar with all of them. Um, <laughs> just because the procurement guidelines process, we had to review all of the different standards. We often invited folks from these organizations to come and talk to our food service directors across the 12 campuses to mm -hmm. work together to decide which ones we felt most comfortable mm -hmm. incorporating into our sustainable procurement guidelines. 
right? So you're not the average consumer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about? <laughs> Is it confusing to go to the grocery store? <laughs> that's in, so say that that those are the ones that touch on labor, but there are many others right, that are climate friendly and integrated pest management and organic and regenerative and this and that. I mean they're that's just right, just a small sample yeah. of them. <laughs> exactly. just a very small sample of them, right? But right. They always say that USDA and organic is the most widely recognized skill mm -hmm. as a label. That mm -hmm. most people know that that's government, but not most, but many people know that that's right. tied to the government. So all these other ones are sort of proliferation, and even regional ones that have labels. So and even, challenge. right, and in addition to the ones that have labels, there are all of these schemes, you know, that like most large retailers have their own. Kind of um, uh, Standards and, and verification schemes that they you know require for suppliers. My like Starbucks, yeah, cafe, Starbucks, yeah. Starbucks. Or Walmart, or <laughs> Kroger's, or Costco, or yeah. McDonald's. Yeah. They're always fighting to get into like procurement guidelines. They're like we have our own standards. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how often these are used on produce, but I associate them with processed food. And I try to eat more fresh food if I can. So I often see that and think, oh, right, this is the product I shouldn't be eating. Wow. Yeah, and like you were saying, um, sorry, what is your name? I'm Anne. I'm Anne from the book of food. Um, yeah, these are definitely just a subset. There's so many different labels out there, um, which is good in a way because we're trying to pay more attention, right, to more things and verify and get out there and really be more transparent. Um, and within these, even if they are just of labor, there's different verification and, and the whole program can be different. Many of these are definitely on produce, for produce, as well as other products, commodities, processed, packaged and now other categories as well. Um, the bottom right, uh, the Fair Trade Federation, the World Fair Trade Organization, they're more focused on fairly traded goods. So it's not like they are a certification program on their own, but they're, you know, provide a general oversight and some principles that everyone has to, you know, align with and commit to. Um, you've got Rainforest Alliance, it's got labor, but also heavily focused on environmental. One. Um, the Fair Food Program, that's a very exciting one, started down in Florida, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, really doing great work to bring visibility to a lot of real issues in the tomato industry and just issues domestically. I think they've done a really great job at bringing that to the forefront with documentaries and they're out there really making noise. Um, they're, they're domestic right now, mainly in tomatoes, and they've been supporting other groups as well, like Migrant Justice, that's working in the dairy category, working out with Ben Jerry's. Um, the Food Justice Institution, that's the Agricultural Justice Project, various different organizations coming together and also you know, trying to create their own um, programs for labor and, and more. They have a lot of labor, but they also kind of beyond that. Um, you know, the top left, Fair Trade, that's the Fair Trade International level. That's, that started way back in the, even before that, there was Max Havilar back in the 50s, late 40s, really starting out that Fair Trade movement, or the socially, environmental responsibility movement. Um, we've got the, the EFI Responsible Drone, some of the bottom left, Fair Trade Certified from Fair Trade USA. Um, and Fair for Life, that I believe it's recently also joined forces with EcoCert. So there's a variety of different approaches, but I think we all align on a lot of the main principles, right? No child labor, no forced labor. Let's protect the workers from you know, equipment and, and harsh environmental is um, issues there and the environment. Yeah, the condition. Um, and each, you know, with our own approach. What I like to say is, Everyone should be paying attention to what's happening in the supply chains. Let's pay attention. Let's get one 
let's buy products with one label or another at this point. We just got to get everyone going and being more conscious. And later, you know, we can talk more about that. Well, we will be talking today a little bit about the, our different programs. But what I'm, what I'm trying to encourage everyone to do is, hey, get on the train. Let's <laughs> get on the train, whichever, like, door you want to enter it through. Let's start paying more attention to these issues and demanding solutions and more transparency. Also, isn't there, um, I should know more about this, but isn't there, is there now a, like, one place you can, a consumer can go to to get information about the variety of, of different um, labeling programs? There's a portal. Yeah, there is. Um, I don't remember who runs it. We'll, we'll, we'll get it. Yeah, we'll get it. I have it written down somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Oh, definitely. Because I think there's been a call for that. Like, ah, where do we go to get information, right? A, a couple of sources. One is I'm Margaret Reeves from Customer Transaction Network and with the EFI with Lillian. Mm -hmm. um, one source is Consumer Reports some years ago mm -hmm. did a comparison, mm -hmm. so they probably have access. Another one is Domestic Fair Trade Association focusing on labor. has also done a comparison of different labels. So those are two places that have explicitly done comparisons. Mm -hmm. uh, they're probably right. Yeah, I think there's like a, a a portal now specifically directed at consumers and yeah, yeah. try to find it. Okay. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Um, I mean, how much of your work is really directed at the individual consumer versus the the retailers or the larger structures in place that are controlling what consumers can access to? I mean, are is, are you is it both or is this really about trying to get individual people? make their own individual collections based on various labels. Yeah, good question. I think the the idea is, well, from Fair Trade USA's perspective, we work across the entire supply chain. So working with retailers, working with consumers, understanding what are they interested in, what are retailers interested in, what are their own goals. Um, our organization, our mission was is to empower and support you know, producers and workers, um, but in order to do that successfully and really integrate into a successful business model, it's about working with the market. So from retailers down and farmers and workers up as well, but really engaging in conversations throughout the whole supply chain. And I think, yeah, you know, it's similar for EFI. Approach. EFI is a younger program and there hasn't been um, a huge offer of of certified produce in the marketplace up until now, so there hasn't that hasn't been the focus of our work. It, you know, it's consumer state directed advertising or education, but although that's you know the next step, we're you know, hoping to start doing that soon, so that to educate consumers about about that label and about the program. But it didn't. It, it hasn't been the focus up until now. I ask it because you know we focus. We include these types of issues, and then a lot of less work, you know, a lot on nutrition. And we know the failures in terms of like trying to reach individual people one by one in terms of driving behaviors with what you are mm -hmm. provided information. And the more we continue to do that, <laughs> we already have overwhelmed population of people in terms of food for a variety of reasons. So I guess, you know, it feels like as much as we can make it easier for consumers to select product by working at the other chains uh, in the, within the system. And making the offer, what's yeah, offer is more it clear, healthy. But if we try to keep reaching yeah. individual people, like what, you have to pay attention to so many things that, that it is overwhelming and people yeah. struggle. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Right, we would want to think that everything that is available is produced fairly and safely. And Right, and getting the retailers on board so you yeah. know, I mean, I think we have some retailers in the market who try harder than others now, yeah. right? But anyway, people who care know that they can get affordable, high-quality products that somebody is curating for them. Right. You yeah. can see the labels, but, but anyway, the, that'll make it easier for people. Yeah. That's great. 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 And you're following up on that, it's interesting because we were working in like very similar like where we controlled the environment in our residential dining operations on our campuses where the students really didn't have much choice other than what they were, what item selections they were choosing in the dining room yeah. versus our retail operations on campus. 
And so we were really able to control procurement in our campus dining rooms because the students, they didn't actually see the price of, for example, the fair trade bananas that we put out for them. Um, and then when we put out the fair trade bananas for them in the retail environment, uh, they were not only faced with that consumer level information, but also the price. They actually got to make a decision. And we found that it was much more challenging to get the fair trade bananas to move in the retail environment because there was this cost barrier. But when we removed that by just eliminating that choice for them, we made the decision to incorporate that into their food program. They ate those bananas regardless. Um, so it's, yeah, when you have a little bit more control over creating the environment for whoever your consumer is for us as a student, mm -hmm. then they automatically make the default choice of consuming a fair trade banana, for example. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah, that versus consciously making the decision and a lot goes into that. We have to you know, put up stories and you have to make the case why pay a little bit more versus, hey, just take this, good for you. Yeah. And <laughs> adding on that, if there's, you know, a label overload and let's say you have a fair trade USA certified thing and you have a fair food certified thing and they're different prices and you don't know, like, which maybe you don't know the information behind the label, I feel like it could be thing and you would just go by price maybe at that point. Mm -hmm. You're like, I want something that's labeled, but I don't know which label I care about more. Mm -hmm. What I've seen at retailers at least now is they don't tend to buy the same product in like EFI mm -hmm. and Fair Trade or Fair Trade International and Fair Trade USA. It might be mm -hmm. different varieties of tomatoes perhaps, mm -hmm. but the same one, usually, I haven't seen them. Um, but I definitely understand the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's also interesting along the same theme. There's been some research come out recently that uh, decision making and a lot of choice is very stressful. So we're actually increasing the stress levels. We're asking people to take too many factors into consideration. So we're adding stress to their lives, which actually is not healthy. It's less healthy. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's just you know compounding this issue of putting all the burden on the consumer. Um, may, maybe a important element in garnering consumer support or policy change. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's the policy change of either the store or the governmental level that's going to have the broad effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and consumer involvement and in making that change happen is important mm -hmm. and has been important throughout history. Um, but probably by itself, you know, it, uh, eventually it has to lead to policy change. Either, like you said, at the store level, it can happen mm -hmm. or, at, or at the larger level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just, we don't have to spend a lot of time on, on this, just that, you know, there have been surveys and studies that show that there are a lot, that, that lots of consumers actually do support transparency, right, in, in the supply chain, knowing, having information about um, how their food is produced, where it comes from, uh, how it gets to them, and, and a lot, so they'd be willing to pay more for Okay. I don't know any other comments about that. Okay, we have 20 minutes. Are we here for one? Yeah, and we want to leave time yeah. for more conversation, of course. So, yeah, what we thought is we would just give you some, briefly give you some, a little bit more background about the two programs that we work for um, and work with. And uh, I'll, yeah, I will try to do this quickly. So, yeah, I work with the Equitable Food Initiative. Margaret is on the board. Um, Ron has done some research um, about the organization, so feel free to chime in as well. Um, EFI was um, started around um, 10, 8 years ago by a, uh, a, a um, multi-stakeholder group of uh, retailers, uh, producers, farm worker organizations and civil society organizations um, protecting consumer interests. Uh, and that in itself was kind of a big deal to bring to sort of, you know, these different sectors to the table to talk to each other and figure out what their common interests were in um, reforming and transforming the food system. So that's a whole interesting story in itself. Um, and, um, the, the retailer that 
kind of what has been driving a driving force behind DSI from early on is Costco. Um, they um, have uh, they were the first retailer to get involved and say that we um, will uh, pay you know will will pay a premium for certified for labeled produce um, because it you know we think that it offers us extra assurance um, about the things that we care about. Um, and then and Whole Foods then came on board, and uh, as well as Bon Appetit Food Management Company. And so we're working really hard to bring on more retailers um, because the more retailers, the more will be available, and um, the more it benefits produce, producers and farm workers. Um, this is a label. Um, and uh, the idea behind this label is that, um, especially the farm worker assured part, is that uh, what kind of essential uh, characteristic of the EFI program is that there's uh, every every operation that takes um, that, that takes part in the program creates a, a leadership team, a, a labor management team of people um, on the on the farm in the operation that represents all the workers. And that and that team is is re largely responsible for um, uh, getting to know the standards, communicating with the rest of the workforce, with management, identifying problems that could uh, affect compliance with the standards, and 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 proposing solutions. So the idea is that um, uh, in addition to the um, the once a year audit, which uh, which does is part of the program, you have everyone on the farm that is informed and educated and, and helping to monitor compliance with all of these standards in the areas of labor practices, food safety, and uh, pest management. Um, there, it involves a, um, a, a financial bonus that goes to um, pays paid from the retailer to the producer and then ultimately to the worker as yeah, compensation for their higher level of involvement in uh, and participation in in monitoring compliance um, and in recognition of their their knowledge and skills and, and expertise. Uh, these are some of the producers um, these are, that are these are the producers that are participating at this point um, in the program. Um, so it, it's a, another way for us to let consumers know, you know, kind of which uh, uh, brands they can look for. Who are not all of the operations associated with these producers are certified, but these are producers who have stepped forward and said, we want to participate in this program. Um, these are some figures about CSI's reach at this point, um, active in the US, Canada, Mexico, and, and Guatemala. Uh, about 29,000 workers on farms with trained teams and about 5 million premiums that have been in bonuses that have been generated. And then we've um, had done um, one, so far one um, comprehensive external um, impact evaluation um, that touched on um, some of these different areas um, of, of impact related to um, skills and and capacities developed both at the individual level, at the organizational sort of management level, and then more broadly in the, in the industry. Um, organizational culture shifts, that's ultimately the goal, is to bring about a broader change in the culture of uh, farming and agriculture, um, especially in, in big agriculture. And there are some um, interesting indicators that of those things starting to happen. Um, more, much more commu close communication and collaboration um, among all of the different parts of the workforce that impact um, 
the ways in which um, the, the types of management systems that are that are used, you know, strengthening management systems and also management approaches, um, and just a greater kind of appreciation of everyone's contribution to the work that's that's getting done. Um, I'm just trying to do this really quickly, but there's there's lots more information that you can look up if you're interested. Uh, yeah, and then among improved working conditions, um, one of the things that has been mentioned um, in a couple of different uh, valuations is that um, people have have talked about generally feeling more more respected and um, more uh, uh, heard, and then especially women have have talked about the lower incidence of, um, of sexual harassment. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'll leave it there for now. There's, there's but yes, yeah, lots, yeah. in, lots more information on the website and this is the summary of the, of the impact evaluation. You can ask, answer questions. Yeah, sure. Did you have a question? Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, so fair trade. Like I was saying a while ago, fair trade is kind of the, the legacy movement regarding a lot of the social environmental revolution, I guess you could say. And it really did start at the end of the 40s, early 50s, in coffee co ops in Mexico, in Chiapas, Mexico, where you had some Europeans go and realize hey, this coffee is awesome, you guys aren't making a lot, how come, what's going on here? Oh, middlemen, oh, okay, let's create some market, direct market linkages. And that's how fair trade essentially started, with those direct market linkages. Over the years, it's really developed to not only include coffee, with smallholders organized in co-ops and just have that be a market linkage program, but it's really developed into much more, where now it's not just smallholders and co-ops, it's small producers that are independent. It's also large farms that the benefit goes towards their farm workers as well. Not just coffee, but it's also expanded into um, tea and chocolate and sugar and produce, floral. And um, within, oh, I'll show you in a moment, within Fairtrade USA, we've also expanded into other product categories outside of agriculture as well. But fair trade, that's where it starts, right? Small coffee farmers. And it's really exciting, in my opinion, the expansion, because I, I don't drink coffee, so I wasn't able to really support there. Chocolate every now and then. But really, in the produce category, everyone needs some kind of produce at one point or another. Um, and so, not a fair trade, right, in general, as a movement. And as, it's, as we've continued throughout the decades, it hasn't just been fair trade. Other programs have come about domestically and internationally, which is great. Except for the consumer confusion piece we're talking about. So the fair trade program in general, we have standards. We have very rigorous standards, over 100 of pages for the agricultural production standard. Um, we also, you know, there's verification of these standards as well. We have uh, rigorous uh, training and support programs, rigorous, intense, comprehensive, good support programs for um, all of the folks along the supply chain. As I was mentioning, we work, we train, and uh, work with the farm workers, with the small producers, help farms get certified, work with the importers importing those products, um, working with the retailers as well, and working with the consumers to educate them on what is fair trade, what are the issues, why they should be choosing something or fair trade. <laughs> um, in our standards that covers all of the issues that we're talking about. There are standards and criteria covering working conditions. There's environmental and environmental module, um, health and safety, housing, recruitment, contracting. We cover that all. We don't focus on food safety. That's not directly in our program. In some of our trainings, we do talk about that to help make more of a connection between the workers and the consumers. Um, but our focus mainly is on that human aspect, the labor, right? Besides the standards, there's also uh, fair trade premiums or community development funds that are traditionally um, provided to the communities uh, for collective projects where 
there's this great sequencing uh, that needs to occur, you know, with needs assessments and a lot of other things before money can even be spent. I have Fair Trade USA. We are more than just produce and floral. So my category, produce and floral, we work at the same level as EFI, but there's different categories at Fair Trade USA as well. Coffee, of course. Um, there's a consumer packaged goods department with the tea, the chocolate, the sugar, coconut. Um, we have a fisheries program now as well, and a factories program where um, different products being assembled um, in factories, there's support for those factory workers as well. So we've really branched out to five different product categories now. Um, Fair Trade USA, we've been around since 1998. We worked really closely with Fair Trade International in 2008, and we were supporting their certifications in the market here in the United States. In 2011, we branched away to also start doing our own certifications to really expand the scope. Um, we wanted to go beyond smallholders in co-ops. We wanted to support smallholders that were independent and workers on farms, large farms as well. Different products and different structure scope. So at Fair Trade USA, since 1998, we've supported um, with a, there's a community of financial impact of over $500 million between those Fair Trade premium funds and uh, there's a coffee di differential there as well because there's some minimum prices in some categories, coffee for example. So if the price you know, is really low on the commercial commodity market, then they have to at least receive a minimum price. And that's really supported a lot of these farmers throughout the years to continue to develop and stay in M. Produce and floral specifically, um, we started working with the flow internet, the Fair Trade International products. Bananas was our first. Um, we worked in pineapples as well. And now there's many, many different product types different tomatoes and bell peppers, cucumbers, um, berries. Mangoes, a lot of different products, which is really exciting. Because again, you can go in and buy a grape, a tomato, a bell pepper, an eggplant, and you're supporting. Mm -hmm. um, within produce and floral, um, since 2004, we really picked up in 2012 when we started doing our own certifications. Over around over 40 million dollars <coughs> put back in community development funds. Really exciting impact. I like to see talk about our impact in. A few different ways. There's, of course, the funds that can be um, in, for small producers and some workers in some occasions, cash bonuses. Otherwise, it goes into funds with committees and the whole structure to be able to spend those on projects. Um, but outside of that, you have impact from compliance with the standard, like we were talking about, protections on the farm, feeling engaged, having a voice, a lot of impact right there. And there's empowerment on so many levels. Empowerment at that compliance level, at the fund level. Empowerment when choosing what to do with these additional funds. Empowerment from being on committee. We're right? seeing wonderful empowerment from, you know, women developing themselves in committees and telling me how their children have even seen them develop and, and kind of taking new attitudes. There's generational impact as well. Really a lot of different levels when you get people involved in their own lives, right? Um, we work with, the, uh, we've got around 90 certificates of our own, and we also work with around 60 from Fair Trade International, over 35 different grant partners we work with. Um, and we work with very, very, very small producers, um, like Florelia, I believe her name was, in Haiti, where she has one mango tree in her yard, and she participates with her neighbors, and they all collect the mangoes and with other neighbors and they bring them down to the city and they have a fair trade Haitian mango program as small as one tree in their yard. And we work from with small producers to very large producers, you know, industrial uh, bell pepper greenhouses. Um, traditionally, we've also, we've been working internationally, but since 2016, we started certifying domestically as well. Because what we're able to see is farm work is farm work anywhere, and there's issues everywhere. Different issues, different situations, but there's issues. So now we're also working domestically, producing floral, seafood, and factories as well. 
with some of these, um, with the Fair Trade Premium Fund. There's amazing uh, different projects and impacts that's happened from medical clinics, dental clinics, all the way to little school buses that the farm workers purchase collectively to be able to transport their kids to school and then rent it back to the farm to transport the workers. Different things on farm projects and projects back in home communities as well where the workers are coming from. There's a lot of different things that can happen with these funds. But the, the important piece is that it's a framework for folks to keep developing themselves and to include the market mainly in supporting and pushing this transparency. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got some folks, like Costco in a lot of cases, using it as a risk management tool. You've got folks like Whole Foods wanting to go above and beyond and talk about it. Whichever way, it's, uh, it's all about jumping into one program or another. Right, for one level or another of all this impact that we've been talking about. So is that? Simply close out our piece in a few minutes. For any more questions, definitely question over here. Oh, thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't um, want to interrupt. The um, really fascinating. I, I just also wanted to say, I think it's so terrific that two, the two of you are talking together and collaborating right. because one of the things, as you know, has happened is that there's competition for mm -hmm. the labeling mm -hmm. and the certification approaches, mm -hmm. which, I mean, it has its advantages, like you were saying, that there's all this proliferation, but it also tends to generate more confusion and mm -hmm. not necessarily healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so gr great that yeah, yeah, each other yeah. as complementary. <laughs> yeah. Well, work and I've, worked on, on, I've trained on, on farms that had both certifications. And, and actually where the committee, the EFI committee, was also the Fair Trade Committee, mm -hmm. and so was able to you know, see that overlap and, and learn about the projects that they were working on with Fair Trade, so that's been interesting. Yeah, and just as an anecdote, I've worked in the in wine grapes and wine industry for many years here in California, and there, there are many certification programs just in California alone, mm -hmm. many of which include labor standards, mm -hmm. and yet there's this kind of competition between the regions even better and there's some collaboration but it wasn't always fruitful again because of all of this confusion for consumers yeah. but anyway yeah. my, my question was um, when you look at the impact um, for both of your programs which is amazing really um, I'm wondering if you trace it also to actually the, the product what how much is actually getting to the market because I mean you talked a little earlier that in the case of EFI it's kind of new and not that many products actually have the label on it but this goes back to the point that I think Danny was making earlier is that, you know, some retailers may choose not to put the label on, some may do it, but does it make an impact on consumers' choice? Is it moving in the marketplace? You know, do you track actually the increase in uptake when it reaches consumers? I don't know if there's any way to do that or whatever, but I was just curious kind of like the, the, the end point of where these consumers where they're going and how's demand growing and that kind of thing. That's something you've tracked. We, we do some studies um, every year with the Natural Marketing Institute, I believe it is, tracking um, similar data from what we've shown about you know, recognition or receipt purchase <coughs> and more. But right now we're starting to design some studies to track better exactly what you're saying. That purchase or that, that follow through and and the different factors that influence at, at the store level. We're currently working on this, but um, yeah, so. But it, you see demand is growing. Oh, demand, yes. Definitely see demand is growing, more recognition and demand. Um, I honestly, I think a lot of things that like the CIW, Coalition of Democracy Workers, what they've done with having a lot of celebrities be part of their campaigns and protests and movies, it's really helped bring the issue to the forefront of a lot of more uh, people's homes, I think. Um, in that sense, the domestic, the internationally, it's kind of already been known. From, from my perspective, I have seen definitely an increase, but I think altogether, EFI and us and others, in progress at least, we're still less than 1% of the industry. So there's a lot more to grow. And you've got more retailers being interested now, which is important. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, no, I, I mean, as you said, it's, it's, it's still very early on. Um, we have not, I, I, yeah, have not focused 
much so far on um, the um, consumer demand um, that will be for the future. Correct me if I'm wrong, Margaret, but yeah. Um, and, and it's well, it's an interesting conversation because I, I just like when we when we train the teams, you know, we talk about um, their, you know, what they think that consumers are looking for. Are do, do consumers care about who produces their food? You know, who, who the farm workers are, how they're treated. People are skeptical about that, and in fact, they reckon, you know, and we talk about the fact that well, we're farm workers, but we're also consumers, and. As consumers, we often don't think about these things when we go to the supermarket. <laughs> so it's a yeah, it's a complex it's a complex question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then they have a you know they have an increased awareness of it you know by the time we finish the training. Do you have a question, Jen? Yeah. So so this food safety piece of it. So one of our biggest barriers in working with small and regional farmers or even some of our international fair trade certified farmers is they weren't meeting the good agricultural practices guidelines, um, which is kind of an industry standard for best practices to prevent food safety on the farm level. So is EFI incorporating G GAP? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yes. It, um, it's it's embedded within the standards, as far as I understand, right? That that is, yeah, yeah and, it's, and it's the standard is being uh, modified to specifically benchmark on GFSI. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then also GAP, and, but GFSI is, is sort of the, the bottom benchmark. Well, also those additional Every everyone has their, their own. Language. So, and that's part of the goal is to not increase the number of, of audits that, that producers have to get, right. but rather um, combine, a, yeah, benchmark the standard, the EFI standards, especially in the area of food safety, but also in labor and social responsibility to other existing um, schemes so that, so that producers can reduce the number of audits. Because yeah, it's time consuming and expensive and exhausting. Is that true also for fair training EFI that there's some alignment and overlap of the approaches? Or? Well, it's, it's interesting because, yes, some farms have been certified with both. We share one of the certification bodies, the same certification body, and I think when there has been like that double certification, there has been some efficiencies found in that benchmarking or kind of a gap analysis to, you know, check one thing. Mm -hmm. For both to not have to right, duplicate, not, not duplicate the, 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 the audit. Exactly. Right. right, to completely duplicate the audit. Oh, that's good to know. I see where it was half time. I mean, I still have time, but I know, I don't know about everybody else. Any other last questions? So, one of our, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we were interested in was, you know, just from a consumer perspective, you know, is this kind of information helpful or useful? And that it was, and so I think we had some conversation about that earlier, which, which I thought was interesting and, and you know a new perspective, or just it was a helpful way to think of it. Is it, it is very confusing to have all these labels, and and it would be helpful to all of us to to have the the curating or the work done right at the level of the retailer or the food service provider. Right. So that consumers don't have to wade through so many labels. So, yeah. Thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to come speak with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.